Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Griffith, and I'm a senior program associate with the Woodrow Wilson Center Science and Technology Innovation Program. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this Wilson Center event on Canada and the United States in the new quantum tech era. This event would not have been possible without the partnership and support of the Embassy of Canada and the Wilson Center's Canada Institute. My deepest thanks go out to both. Today, our focus is on emerging quantum technologies. Over the course of the next hour, we will offer a deep dive into the technologies in question, the areas for concern and excitement across government and industry, and then opportunities for US-Canada cooperation going forward. Before I introduce our first speaker today, please take a moment, if you have not done so already, to familiarize yourself with everyone's bios on the event page. In the interest of time, I will be keeping introductions short, but it goes without saying that today's event would not be possible without this uniquely qualified and diverse group of experts. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Eric Miller. Mr. Miller is the president of the WeDo Potomac Strategy Group and will be helping us frame today's session. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Melissa. It's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about this important topic. I think the term revolution is used very frequently, but in this case, we actually mean it because what we are seeing right now is the beginning of a true technological transformation. Quantum mechanics, which we really saw defined a little over 100 years ago by some great physicists such as Niels Bohr, is really coming now to, into application through technology where the phenomenon which was described as really being able to be directly manipulated. We saw uh, in earlier iterations, technology such as MRI machines, which used quantum knowledge, but now we are on the edge of something truly transformational. We look, for example, at quantum computers, which have attracted a great deal of attention. Once the error correcting technology, once the power base is there, they will be able to ex far exceed anything that we have seen uh, classical computers be able to do. And this will mean looking at connections that were not before possible. So second and third order interaction effects of how molecules in drug development play out. And this will mean that the vision of personalized medicine that many have long dreamed about where a treatment is able to, to be made for the individual in question is something that is possible. And of course, in any of these technological transformations, there's also other dimensions. So for example, the computer security protocols that were based on uh, the mathematical theory of what's called prime factorization will all of a sudden be rendered potentially useless. And we will have to rethink a whole new way for how we do network security and security of communications. And of course, there's discussions about quantum internet and quantum sensing and quantum imaging, where uh, even the US Department of Defense has used a technology called ghost imaging and it's experimented and can look through clouds and, and, uh, and smoke with fires at distances of two kilometers or more. And so there's an extraordinary change, which is afoot. And this is possible because our knowledge of the science behind quantum theory has been advanced to such a degree that we are able to understand how to apply and manipulate that knowledge. So to unpack things a little bit, when you have any discussion on quantum, you need to understand some of the unique bases for how the technology works. We have four uh, PhD quantum physicists on this, uh, this webinar today, and they will be able to go as absolutely deep as anyone in the audience would like to, to know. But let me mention three phenomena that are important basic terminologies. The first is superposition. Uh, this is the idea in essence on the classical, on the quantum computer that in essence, a, uh, you can have a zero or one at the same time. You have a low pulse and a high pulse on a classical computer. But because of superposition, you have this strange uh, phenomenon that really leads to much more uh, possible outcomes. You have entanglement as, as you get uh, particles that can move through time and space that are deeply interwoven and interconnected with each other. 
And this is very exciting in terms of highly secure communications. And then of course, uncertainty. And so all of these particular uh, scientific principles, once they are channeled and harnessed, become very powerful technologies. And this is why precisely we are seeing a massive investment globally, a real race globally for dominance of this technology. And so we have seen not only in the United States, which passed the National Quantum Initiative Act at the end of 2017, which had an initial investment of $1.2 billion, most of which has gone to Department of Energy, National Laboratory projects and National Science Foundation projects, and a whole lot of other money that has come out of the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense. But you've also seen Canada, which was a real early adopter and early innovator in this space, that even up to 2018, before most of the general public had ever heard of quantum, had invested more than a billion dollars on building out truly world-class research centers and companies. But of course, we've seen China, which we don't have really good numbers on how much they've spent, but we know that they built a national quantum research laboratory for an estimated $10 billion, and they are spending billions of dollars more every year. Europe, the Euro European unions uh, it invested more than 2 billion euros. Separately, the French and the Germans have each, each invested significant money. Interestingly, Angela Merkel was actually a quantum chemist and so was deeply committed to getting German investments. We've seen India that has committed a billion dollars to quantum research. The Japanese are investing. And so there is a race here that is happening that is not only driven by economics and science, but also by national security. Because if you get a quantum internet, the degree of security of communications will be much, much greater. And the Chinese already said that they've got a secure communications network that runs essentially from Shanghai to Beijing for ultra secure communications. And so overlaying all of this is that defense angle, but at the same time, we're seeing real money going into this. An estimated $1.7 billion last year went into venture capital funding, went into the quantum sector. We have seen in the last six months or so, three uh, established quantum companies going public uh, and turning to capital markets to advance and extend their technologies in this race. And so we are not only seeing this focus on defense and security, but this real interest in economic opportunity. Because as in any technological revolution, there is the opportunity for established players to lose their position and for new players to come in. And if you read the prospectuses of some of these companies, the Rigetti computings of the world, many have said, and I'm not opining specifically on Rigetti's technology relative to others, but they say, we want to put money into this technology because they will be the next app. So it's the idea that you will own the enabling technology of the next phase of the revolution and thus own the platform that will become standardized and adopted. And there are really world leading companies in both the US and Canada pushing ahead on this particular front. And so of course, it is only natural that the US and Canada would want to cooperate, but each comes to the table with its own goals, with its own priorities. Uh, Dr. Vats will talk about uh, the, the work toward a Canadian national quantum strategy. And we've already seen, for example, the government of the United States has signed cooperation agreements with Japan, with the UK, with Australia. And so there is a great deal of interest on the part of the US to cooperate. And of course, the euphemism which gets used in this is like-minded partners because Australia, the UK and Japan are also both concerned about developments in China and what that means to their relative position. And so the question is how best can the US and Canada cooperate in a manner which is mutually beneficial both from an economic perspective and also from a security perspective. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to the good folks in the US and Canadian governments, as well as the representatives of the quantum industry associations in the US and Canada to give us all of the answers. So thank you, Melissa.
Thank you so much, Eric. I think mean, that's a very helpful, often when people hear quantum, it seems like a buzzword, it's they're unclear what we're talking about in that space. So I appreciate you sort of scoping that out, what we're talking about, both the economic, the science, the national security concerns, and then the array of investments and the opportunities for both the US and Canada. At this point, it is, I'm going to transition now to a kind of series of speakers, and then we will end with moderated discussion and questions. So our first speaker is Dr. Charles Tahan. Dr. Charles Tahan is the director of the National Quantum Coordination Office, and he will be offering us insight into the US approach. Please, Charles, take it away. All right, thank you, uh, Melissa, and thank you, Eric. Uh, for that nice opening. I'm, it's a real pleasure to join everybody today for the discussion uh, around quantum and US-Canada, uh, different approaches to, to quantum investments. Here in the US, uh, as Eric mentioned, we've been obviously doing research for a long time and coordinating at a high level uh, here within the White House uh, among all different agencies that fund uh, quantum R&D. In 2018, the National Quantum Initiative Act was passed by Congress, which created my office here in OSDP, the National Quantum Coordination Office, which has representatives from the major funding sources across the government, Department of Energy, NSF, Department of Defense, Intelligence Community, NIST, as examples, and also created two subcommittees on quantum, one civilian-led subcommittee on quantum information science, and the other, the Subcommittee on the Economic and Security Implications of Quantum Science to coordinate and develop strategies for the US ecosystem you know, around building up this technology. But actually the strategy started to be developed even before that act was passed, you know, because the, there are maybe 13 or more agencies and organizations in the government alone who have equities in quantum information science technology. Either they fund R&D directly, or they are potential end users, or they have cybersecurity um, interests in, in the technology. And it was realized quite early on that, you know, quantum is a foundational technology that will impact a lot of different fields. It not only has the implications to, you know, revolutionize computing in certain areas and, and perhaps networking, um, and for sure, sensing, we've already seen examples, you know, so-called quantum 1.0 technologies making a difference with GPS and, and MRI imaging. But that, you know, understanding how to take advantage of this technology was critical, but also how to protect the United States as these technologies develop um, uh, was just as important. So, you know, throughout the last uh, few years, quantum has stayed a national priority. Uh, if I could summarize, you know, how we think about the focus here in the White House, it's it's getting the science right, it's enhancing competitiveness of the U.S. and our, and our partners, and getting the people right. And I'll sort of describe those briefly in terms of our strategy, which covers six big policy areas. The first is science. You know, quantum information science is really only 20, 25 years old depending on how you count, maybe 30, you know, some people even push 40, <laughs> but it's still a pretty early technology. And there are many different realizations of computers, sensors still being deployed. So it's really important to get the science right, meaning not to pick too early, to focus on the hard problems first and to understand the applications that will really benefit society. Because at the end of the day, you know, this is going to matter when it matters to real people, right, in, in, our, in our societies. So understanding the applications is still critical. And there's still many open questions about when uh, certain quantum technologies will be relevant, like the quantum computer. Enhancing competitiveness. So this, this includes nurturing our, our, our early industries and getting them through the next decade or two decades until there really are, you know, meaningful and large scale economic utility of these of these these machines or devices, but also how to protect um, the US. So moving to post-quantum cryptography or quantum resistance cryptography in, in well in advance of the potential of a fault tolerant quantum computer, which could crack the public key encryption that we use today. So that's a critical thing. Um, how do we protect IP? How do we protect our investments? Um, you know, how does that affect export controls? You know, all of those and all everything I'm going to talk about are, you know, those are international 
questions and problems that we have to work through together. And the same is true with, for the third area, which is people. You know, how do we create the talent base to enable this new, whole new field? Um, we all have sort of a talent crunch going on because we just can't hire enough people fast enough to staff our governments, staff our industry, staff our universities. How do we work together to accelerate learning of quantum information science? Um, and then how do we ensure that this new field benefits people broadly and not just a very narrow sliver of our societies? You know, similar questions are asked about AI and other areas. And you know, in quantum, it's important we, we figure out what are the quantum specific problems that we should address and, and how can we move to, since we, we do have a little bit of time, how can we move to fix them before they become real, real problems? So, and since that's science, you know, the other areas, industry, uh, workforce, balancing economic and national security, investing in the right infrastructure, continuing international collaboration where, you know, it's really necessary. That's the U.S. strategy. And, you know, we look forward to working with, you know, all our friends to move faster because quantum has always been a global, you know, a global endeavor. The, the, especially between U.S. and Canada, the quantum fields have been intertwined for decades uh, and have built on advances from one country to another, you know, as this field is built up to something we hope will be really impactful to society. So really look forward to having a good discussion and, and seeing, you know, in the future where we can work together better. Thank you so much, Charles. I think it's helpful to understand the kind of comprehensive approach coming out of US government in this space, the understanding of the linkages between countries, and then your comment about we have the time. So using time to our advantage are incredibly helpful. We're now gonna pivot from what's happening in the US space to what's happening on the Canadian side in that space. So we'll now do a deep dive into Canada as sort of a build off of that. Our next speaker is Dr. Nipin Vats. Dr. Vats is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Science and Research at the Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. Please take it away. Thanks very much, uh, Melissa, and uh, thanks to the Wilson Center and uh, my fellow uh, panelists today for the opportunity to talk about uh, this important uh, topic. Um, I'd like to just maybe start off by uh, providing a bit of a, an overview of the quantum ecosystem in Canada. Um, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, you know, Canada is recognized as a, as a, a global leader on quantum science. And uh, like the US, we've, we've been investing kind of patiently in the research enterprise uh, on quantum for quite a long time. Um, and I think Eric also mentioned that over the past 10 years, we've been invested just, to, just over a billion Canadian dollars in the quantum ecosystem uh, from, from government. Um, and much like our, our experience with AI, although I don't want to draw too many uh, parallels to AI because they are quite different in many ways, it has been this sort of long-term investment in research that has kind of built the foundation on which we've, we've been able to build larger scale research initiatives as well as to grow uh, a meaningful and substantial um, uh, industrial ecosystem within the country. Um, uh, and so, uh, as well as to build sort of uh, national centers of expertise built around some of our, our key universities that are, that are conducting research in this space. space. Um, in, in particular, with respect to these sort of areas of expertise, um, I'd, I'd like to highlight sort of the four big centers across the country uh, at, at the risk of, of maybe uh, omitting some important elements of a, of a broader ecosystem, but they are a helpful way of thinking about uh, the activity in the country. Uh, we have the Toronto and Waterloo region that uh, leads in areas related to information, uh, uh, quantum information, quantum communications, and sensors. There's a, there are a variety of commercialization accelerators and incubators in that ecosystem, such as the Quantum Valley Ideas Lab and the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, as well as uh, companies such as Xanadu and, and Renovus. Um, but we also have a, a very uh, well-known center for, uh, for uh, quantum computing research, the Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Mosca is a part of, um, uh, which is the largest institution of its kind in the world. Uh, it's highly ranked internationally in quantum computing publications, um, and that it's it's one of the leading centers in the world for quantum information science research. The second sort of hub is around uh, is in is in the province of Quebec, uh, in the Montreal, Sherbrooke, and to some extent Quebec City corridor where there's a very strong strength in quantum hardware and devices, a lot of uh, innovations with respect to uh, squid-based uh, um, uh, 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 quantum uh, qubits 
um, have been developed uh, by researchers in that area. Companies, uh, both domestic-based uh, and, and multinationals, are in that ecosystem, such as Anion Systems. Uh, IBM has a fairly strong presence there as well. Um, and then uh, in the in the Calgary Edmonton area in Alberta, uh, there's expertise in nanotechnology, which is longstanding expertise uh, in the broader area of nanotechnology, and how and, and so it's being focused on on quantum applications, but also in in quantum information and enabling technologies. And the province is building a network to encourage uh, the acceleration and commercialization of quantum technologies. And then finally, in the Vancouver region, uh, there's a focus on quantum algorithms and hardware development. Um, uh, and there are companies there that are probably known to many around uh, the table, including D-Wave uh, and One Qubit. D-Wave uh, is being uh, an early uh, quantum computing company focused initially on annealing technologies. And then One Qubit, uh, which is a software company dedicated to producing commercial applications for quantum computers. And there's a lot of complementarity uh, amongst the different centers of quantum expertise. Um, so all of this has sort of uh, emerged through uh, largely what's been bottom-up funding, uh, very organically driven, and the approach has been quite successful in terms of growing organically an ecosystem that that has uh, the research elements, the talent, and and uh, and a, a, an ecosystem of companies. But as the opportunities start to grow, and as we kind of accelerate uh, the development of quantum technologies, uh, you know, more focused investments, both domestically and with respect to international collaboration, become all the more important. And it's in that context that we've, uh, we announced in our last budget, the development of a national quantum strategy. So uh, it's, it's a commitment of $360 million uh, as a first phase of investments to support the implementation of a strategy to ensure that we can take our ecosystem to that next level. The, 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 the strategy is currently under development, but it, it's no, it'll be no surprise to, the, the, you know, it will focus on areas such as, as uh, uh, doubling down our strength in research, growing quantum ready talent and supporting uh, the growth and success of a strong commercial sector, both for the development of these technologies, but also for their use, for their application for sectors of the economy. Um, uh, we held consultations uh, late last year um, uh, and, and recently released a what we heard report from broad consultations and we expect the strategy proper to come out later this year. Uh, now, if I could just turn quickly to um, international cooperation, I mean, um, it, as, as Charles said, I mean, it is, it is fundamental to this area uh, of research. Uh, you know, uh, if you look uh, at bibliometric data in Canada from 2011 to 2020, 70 percent of Canadian publications in quantum related areas were involved in international collaborators so it just it demonstrates how global the reach of this is um, and um, uh, you know uh, research, researcher mobility collaboration on science are just essential to, to stay up with uh, with what's happening at an, at an increasingly fast pace um, in in that context I mean uh, it's also been mentioned that Canada and the US have a long-standing history of collaboration in quantum um, if, again looking at bibliometric data uh, if you look at 2014 to 2018 uh, Canada's top collaborator in quantum was the US while we were the second most prolific collaborator for for US scientists um, and the international collaboration rate on papers in quantum technology globally uh, is higher than in other kind of uh, fields such as chemistry, mathematics, physics, and engineering. Um, I, so uh, collaboration is key, but as, as Charles mentioned, you know, there, we also have to be mindful of security risks. We need to find the right balance uh, you know, in terms of uh, openness and collaboration, but also being mindful to, to potential risks to privacy and security. And also be sort of recognize the, the dual nature of many quantum technologies. And in that context, Canada and the US have a lot of uh, potential to, to work together by partnering uh, in the development of technologies, facilitating business collaboration and the movement of, of goods and services across the border uh, in a way that uh, respects, uh, you know, the um, sort of the values that, are, that, uh, that underpin, um, 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 you know, the two countries. Um, and, and in a sense, um, you know, it's almost been too easy to have a Canada-US kind of partnership because we, we more or less speak the same language, <laughs> we more or less have the same cultural references, and there's always been a free flow of, of talent across this border. I think much like the organic collaboration, or sorry, the organic investments that we've had um, uh, in our ecosystem, these organic collaborations have served us really well, but I think the time is upon us to actually think more strategically about how we do these things. 
And um, from a government perspective, um, over the last little while, there have been some, some tangible things in this regard, uh, including in November of last year, there was a joint statement by our Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, as well as the former director of OSTP, uh, um, highlighting shared priorities, including quantum uh, as an area of, of focus, quantum science. Uh, stemming from that, there's been a recent call, uh, joint call by NSERC, our National Science and Engineering Research Council and the National Science Foundation uh, for a funding opportunity focused on discoveries and innovations in, in quantum science and in AI. Um, and this is the first call under a recent MOU between the two agencies. And then uh, you know, there, there's there's quite a long list of these types of things. We we are launching some international uh, grant programs. We're we're uh, we're looking for strong U.S. collaboration. Uh, the U.S. Air Force is working uh, with our effort on a quantum encryption and science satellite. Um, um, so so there's there's a lot of uh, forward momentum in this space, and I think you know um, there is an opportunity to to kind of build that top down connection uh, to complement what's already a very strong bottom up. Uh, a component of our of our relationship, both to advance our mutual interests, uh, but also to advance well to to advance our respective interests together, but also to advance our mutual interests on the international stage as uh, as as uh, as we kind of look at uh, a global effort uh, with respect to advancing a range of of quantum technologies. So I look forward to the discussion on on all of those fronts. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nipin. It's very helpful to, again, see that mirroring between the sort of U.S. and Canadian approach around this very ecosystem diversity of efforts with a diversity of actors. And I appreciate your call there. There's a little bit of a word of warning not to rest on our, our laurels and assume since so much cooperation is happening between the United States and Canada that that is sufficient. And to maybe think a little bit more strategically about that going forward. So we've now sort of had some discussions on national level conversations, what's happening in governments and sort of how this cooperation is understood from those perspectives. I'm now going to pivot the conversation a little bit and look more to private sector and industry, because governments are not the only name in town, right, when it comes to any types of technologies, including quantum. Our next speaker is Dr. Celia Merzbacher. Dr. Merzbacher is the executive director of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, and she will be offering us some insights into industry dynamics in the United States. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks for the opportunity to be with you. Um, thanks to the Wilson Center and to Canada Institute for hosting this. Um, my name is Celia Mertzbacher. I am the Executive Director of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. Very uh, descriptive title. The, I'll talk a little bit about QEDC in a moment, but I wanted to sort of um, make three points here with my few minutes that I'm going to speak. One is that quantum is global. We've already heard that, and I'll flesh that out a little bit further. QEDC is global. And finally, I believe the solutions to the issues that stand in the way of making progress are global. And so um, I'm, this is a great opportunity to start tackling some of those issues together between the US and Canada. So um, quantum technology, as we've heard, is emerging globally. Um, a paper that I sometimes refer to is now a couple of years out of date. In 2020, Michelle Couric put out a paper where he did a great job of um, analyzing the patent data, the publication data, and the available investment data by government and private sector. Um, it's, it's freely available, and it's a nice summary um, that shows the breadth and the global nature of the um, discovery and innovation that's happening based on these proxy metrics. Um, second, companies that are in the quantum industry are or have visions of being global. And that's both in terms of their business, they want to be um, selling to customers around the world, and their supply chains also tend to be global because it is such a, um, a, a globally emerging ecosystem. Um, I think also it's important to recognize that in an emerging area like quantum information science and technology, and in all emerging areas, frankly, diversity of thought is really good for innovation. So um, this is especially true, in my opinion, with regard to applications that have broad societal goals and needs. And so getting broad input and participation in the process uh, is important. And so diversity on sort of all axes, including uh, around the world. As we heard from uh, Charles Tan and from Nipun Bats, 
Um, the governments are interested in collaboration. US government, as was mentioned, has signed um, agreements between the US and Japan, the US and Australia, the US and the UK. And uh, I won't be surprised if other similar agreements are signed because there's um, a general posture that is coming from the government uh, in a lot of areas, suggesting that the US government recognizes that uh, it can't go it alone, that the US is, can't assume that it's in a leadership position in every area. And that, uh, again, going back to my first point, areas like quantum are emerging and there are centers of excellence around the world. And clearly, as we heard uh, to our north. Uh, so QEDC um, is a consortium of stakeholders. It was called for in 2018 in the National Quantum Initiative Act that was passed in the US. Um, and that term stakeholders is broad uh, and is interpreted broadly. So we have members from across the, I guess what you would call innovation ecosystem from academic researchers and our national labs. Um, but we're really uh, driven uh, by industry. And so our core membership is the corporate participant. And up until the end of last year, that was limited to US-based companies. But within that uh, category, we have everything from suppliers of small subsystems and particular um, critical technologies up until system integrators and developers and um, even end users, as well as organizations that provide services, fabrication, intellectual property, law uh, support, and so on. So um, this very diverse group of organizations is the, the sort of consortium that's got a goal and a vision of enabling and growing the quantum industry. Um, so I get up every day asking myself, how can we as a group um, accelerate progress towards the economic um, value that quantum offers? So it's very complementary to the investments that the government make. It's really focusing on building on those investments, extracting value, carrying it forward into economic value. And finally, I want to touch upon the um, global nature of the issues. And I'll just close by, I guess, commenting on areas where QEDC members are focused that are really global in nature. Um, and, and I guess before I, I leave the QEDC membership, I do want to um, acknowledge that when we opened to non-US members at the end of last year, that included companies from Canada. And we do already have a couple of Canadian companies that have joined QEDC, so we welcome those and we look forward to um, having additional uh, members from, from Canada and other parts of the world. Um, so finally, the areas where uh, there is a need to understand um, uh, the gaps and what, what stands in the way of progress include um, the following. Understanding, uh, we of, often use the term use cases, but really from an industry point of view and a business point of view, it's understanding markets. What are the potential markets? What are the uh, timelines towards achieving those markets? How can a company make investments to intersect those future markets? Because frankly, today, it's largely a research enterprise and um, the potential is largely in the future. There are enabling technologies that are needed in order to achieve the use cases that are um, envisioned. And uh, some of those are not quantum at all, lasers or cryosystems or vacuum technologies, for example. So working with those existing sectors to develop the technologies that are gonna enable quantum applications to be realized. An important area is standards and standards development is inherently a global uh, activity. And there are standards bodies. We are not a standards developer at QADC, but we support many of them around the world, and there are activities emerging in those organizations. Workforce has been mentioned, and talent mobility is um, one solution to helping to get the right people working in the right places and allowing um, the companies who are looking for talent to, to find them. Um, and finally, I think that it's really international to develop sound policies. And of course, that includes areas like export control, which again is sort of inherently uh, international and global, intellectual property protection, um, and immigration policies. So QEDC has activities very sort of um, bottoms up with our members taking leads in these activities in all of those areas. 
And um, we're excited to be opening the QEDC to broad participation. And I work closely and talk regularly with Misha Mosca. So um, there's strong connections with our counterparts around the world. And um, these are forming a great basis for um, addressing these gaps and I think um, jointly realizing the benefits economic uh, and for national security that um, the quantum information science and technology offers. So with that, I will turn it back over to Melissa, thanks. Thank you so much, Celia. There's a lot there, obviously, to unpack, but I really appreciate the kind of call to remember that these are not just technologies, there's market and industry dynamics at play that are sort of sitting behind these technologies, those synergies between industry and government that sometimes we tend to think if the word technology is in place, there must not be synergy, right, between industry and government. They somehow must be at odds with each other. And then similarly, this call to be global, and I think at a time where we're seeing a lot of concern about entrenchment, thinking about these solely nationally when they've come to critical technologies, that push to open the aperture. So last but not least, our final speaker is going to return us to Canada and offer some industry dynamics and industry insights from the Canadian perspective. And that is Dr. Michaela Mosca. Dr. Mosca is the chair of the Quantum Industry Canada, and he will be offering those insights to close out our four excellent speakers in a row before we move on to moderated discussion. So please, Dr. Mosca, take it away. Well, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I was troubleshooting my audio at the beginning there. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here with my uh, distinguished colleagues. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with all of you. So many great points have been made, so I won't uh, try. I won't repeat them all. I'll maybe focus on a couple that are of a, a special interest, uh, a top of mind for um, the quantum companies, which tend to be uh, SME focused. Not exclusively, of course, but they're obviously a critical part. Uh, of driving this quantum sector forward. And, and much of this actually applies to all the players, even the larger companies. Uh, one thing we most need uh, as a sector, as a sort of this quantum sector is customers for our products and services, right? And so that's probably top of mind uh, for all of us. Uh, and the other thing that sh you know, should be, is definitely on our minds, it's already been mentioned is, we don't just want to address the Canadian and the US markets, we really need to go after the global markets. Otherwise, the economy won't, you won't have the economies of scale and so on. So we want to go after the global market. So we need to also work now to lay that groundwork to make sure we can be big players and have global impact. Um, now, I think most people agree it's a marathon and not a sprint, uh, but a marathon is still a race, okay? <clears throat> you still go assertively, uh, you got your running shoes on, uh, you're, you're running. Um, and so, again, early adopters are critical for nurturing the quantum sector we have and making sure they're there and they're strong when, when all the adopters need them, not just the early adopters. Because there's, there's inevitably a use it or lose it phenomenon. Like if we don't, if we aren't good adopters of, of quality, uh, you know, quantum products and services, they're, they're, they might not be there, uh, certainly not domestically uh, when we need them. Right. So what can we do together to, to make that happen? Um, I think one low-hanging fruit is to look at the common infrastructures we have uh, across you know, Canada and the United States, like our telecommunications infrastructure, our energy infrastructures, uh, and, and so on, where it's more or less really one uh, you know, connected uh, interoperating infrastructure. Let's figure out how quantum impacts those, like or continue to, but we're already doing, let's do it more assertively, right? And let's coordinate and let's get it done, right? The, the lowest hanging fruit is probably making sure they're resilient to quantum enabled attacks. But I just see that as one of the first things to, to get quantum readiness across these critical sectors of our economy. So let's do that. I mean, one piece of that would be an interoperating quantum safe communication network, which integrates both the quantum and non-quantum solutions. And as a precursor, again, with our eye on, with a, uh, our minds on the next generation, the next generation of quantum communication networks. But we already know today we're going to need networks to protect against these quantum enabled attacks. So let's do it and let's do it together. Because there's a multiplier effect, of course, when you have two countries and then maybe a third ally and so on involved in this effort. Um, another thing I think we can do to really drive this forward is to develop and share best practices. Right? We don't need a hundred sort of sort of kind of sort of similar best practices. 
We really just need some authoritative best practices because most people will say, yeah, I would get quantum ready if I knew what that meant and how I'm supposed to do it. So, and as we get there, uh, so some really great examples of this. Um, I said, you know, the department where uh, you know, Dr. Vats works started a Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resilience, which includes many of our you know, close partner company, you know, companies based in the United States. Uh, and there's a quantum readiness working group there. And we work together to develop best practices, which we shared a few months ago. That can be shared with all our critical infrastructures. Uh, another example is what NIST is doing. And Canada has been you know, obviously a strong support of the NIST post quantum process. There's a, the, all the other activity they have on quantum readiness where they're going to develop best practices and share them. And, and let's share these so then we can sort of align, we can more quickly converge to a roadmap of what this means and start implementing that roadmap. Um, a third area, uh, which I alluded to in my very opening remarks, is let's coordinate on the establishment uh, of a strong, you know, a global playing field, a fair and strong global playing field, optimized for bringing value to the end users. Because we know if, they, if it's a fair level playing field, we will, we will win. We will do tremendously well there. And standards are a big part of that. And we've been cooperating for a decade or more now uh, in the NIST process where Canada and the US have been working. You know, Canada has been very supportive. We started the Etsy IQC workshop with our European friends. NIST was one of the founders of that. They've been supportive all along the way. And that's really been helping coordinate the global effort to make sure the quantum safe infrastructures we need are in place. Again, and there's also the quantum computing tools we're gonna need. Again, those are shared infrastructures. Quantum sensing is another disruptor that we need to prepare our economies for. So there, there's many different facets to this uh, you know, quantum uh, industry. And we, I think there's many opportunities for us to work together. Um, inform key sectors of our economy on the need for quantum readiness. So we can get those narratives aligned. And then on the receiving end, if there's understanding and coordination that's shared, they can start becoming strong adopters and the policymakers as well. And then we can, then we'll have a great pull for the wonderful products and services that are being created in the US and Canada and with our close allies. And we'll just have a very strong quantum sector. Again, to bring value to all the user sectors, and then we'll also have a strong quantum sector to add to our economies. So, uh, well, thanks for the opportunity to, to make some repart, remarks on, on behalf of the you know, Canadian uh, quantum industry, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you so much, Michele. I think across all of these conversations, we've had a really good discussion now of why we care, why are we, why are we here virtually or in person to discuss these topics? Where did we come from? Where are we now? And then ending, thank you for sort of this wonderful transition, Michele, into thinking about where do we need to go? What are some of the opportunities moving forward? And as you put it, some low hanging fruit. At this point, we're going to move into moderated conversation and Q&A, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my colleague at the Wilson Center, Dr. Christopher Sands. Um, Dr. Sands is the director of the Wilson Center's Canada Institute, and I will be handing over the event baton to you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melissa. It's a, it's a great honor. I, I know a lot about Canada but I don't know a lot about quantum. And I think this whole panel has been in better hands with you. You actually are the subject matter expert here at Wilson and I, I'm grateful for your stepping in. Um, so I'm late to arrive, but of course, uh, like the Americans of World War II, I'll take all the credit now and uh, ask some questions for all of you. Um, first off, I wanna ask a question for, for you, Michele Mosca. Um, as the quantum industry continues to move forward, what kind of opportunities um, are available for cross-border collaboration between Canada and the United States in particular? I know you talked about some of them, but can you expand a bit on that? If there's a priority, if there's a must-have, where would you go with that? Yeah, um, I would just start converging on some best practices across these heavily intertwined industries. And you know, we already have a lot of them in place, but let's get it across the starting line because it's not really the finishing line, it's really the starting line. Why not have, why don't the Canadian and American financial sectors agree? And again, there's many different impacts of quantum on the financial sector. The cybersecurity is one of them, maybe that's the clearest, but then also quantum computing, right? And the energy sector, uh, let's start again, converging on the best practices and acting on them uh, in a concerted fashion. So once we kind of agree on where we need to go and how to get there, then, then moving is, is a, it's a lot easier to, to, to get the resources and start moving in that direction. 
Excellent. Th thanks very much. Uh, Melissa, do you have the next question? Or I can jump in. I have a million because <laughs> I know so little. Yeah. I would be happy to. So the next question is for Dr. Tahan. And one of the questions that I think comes up a lot in this space are what are the biggest hurdles in quantum that leaders both privately and publicly are currently facing? And how are those obstacles limiting the industry moving forward? Well, that's a pretty broad question because quantum is a is not just one area. I mean, there's quantum computing, there's quantum sensing, there's quantum networking there are quantum enabling technologies, and then there's sort of quantum related technologies like quantum resistant cryptography. So in all of those different areas, you probably get a different answer. Um, you know, I would say maybe at the highest level, um, if I had to pick two things, it would be what are the applications for a, a quantum computer that actually matter to me as a high level policymaker, decision maker in the government? I know that a, a photonic quantum computer of sufficient size puts our encryption that we use today for our national security and our economy at risk. So when is that going to happen? And uh, uh, when and how fast do I need to deploy post-quantum or quantum resistant cryptography? So, I mean, to me, those are the, the two big questions. One is uh, that people I often get asked the most. One is, when is a quantum computer going to be relevant? And uh, what and how much will be relevant, and then uh, what do I do about it? What else would you like me to say? <laughs> I've been answering other questions. I I, lo I love that response because it it leaves us where we where we all want to be after a good panel with more questions than answers. But uh, but I think you've asked the right questions and pointed us in the direction to go, Dr. Tan. Let me, um, let me ask a quick question of, of Dr. Mersbacher. Um, are these opportunities for collaboration between Canada and the US in your, in your uh, conception of it, um, as private industry is discouraged from sharing intellectual property, um, are, are, the, are we seeing those opportunities narrowing at all because of, uh, because of um, intellectual property or government concerns? Or are the possibilities for cross-border collaboration expanding um, because R&D funding's increased, we have more academic institutions creating quantum research programs and, and so forth. How would you characterize the trend line there? Um, well, I think that you've sort of highlighted a couple <coughs> of different dimensions. Um, I think the increased research funding is sort of naturally going to produce economic spin-outs and startup companies and opportunities for economic and, and industry and business activities. And those will probably naturally benefit from cross-border interactions. Um, I think that the um, this, it's not necessarily quantum specific, some of those barriers that you mentioned, um, but when things are growing rapidly, when there's a lot of potential wins, when there sort of is this future abundance um, that we're anticipating, then collaboration is more readily achieved in a way. And um, there's a, a sort of sense that everybody's going to come out ahead by collaborating. And um, so we're very much at that point today. And so I think that gives a tailwind and opens up the sort of um, pocketbooks in a way and, and also the opportunities. Um, and uh, I think that there sort of are very specific areas where I can see um, collaborations being enabled or, or uh, implemented through organizations like QEDC and Quantum Industry Canada, um, you know, identifying some real target uh, gaps and jointly uh, tackling them. Uh, what uh, industry doesn't necessarily require uh, sort of this type of government to government agreements that may be necessary for government interactions. So um, that gives us a little bit more flexibility sometimes and ability to do things um, without as much barrier in the way. Pulling ourselves up from this industry conversation, the next question we have is for you, Dr. Vatz, which is thinking back to this 60,000 foot question, the government level question, what can be done on a higher level by policy leaders or government officials to ensure continuous growth and development in this space for the quantum industry? So if you could put together a wish list at the bilateral level and at the national level, what would those be? 
Well, there, I guess there are a number of different ways to come at that. Um, one that, you know, if you want to go at to 80,000 feet instead of 60,000 feet is to kind of, uh, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is explaining that this is a, this is a long game. Uh, often uh, policymakers uh, want to know when they're going to have a quantum computer on their desk uh, or, uh, you know, like the, the, the time frames and the opportunity set uh, are such that you really have to tr do your best to try and cut through the noise and, and stay focused on what the opportunities are in the short term as well as in the long term. So I think that is an important role that we can play as, 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 as informed policy makers, um, you know, domestically and, and, and internationally. Um, the, the other, you know, the other kind of obvious elements for a government to support the growth of an industry are to focus on talent. Uh, you know, the, the, the pipeline of talent is what anchors industry to a place, uh, to the extent that it is anchored to a place. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, governments have a pretty important role in helping to foster that, that pipeline um, um, and to develop that pipeline, which also includes making sure that, 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 that your talent has a diversity of experience domestically, internationally, and understands what's going on around the world to better inform what Canadian industry can offer. Um, uh, I think other things that were mentioned were frameworks uh, that can, uh, you know, whether they're standards or, 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 uh, or per, you know, other, other aspects of framework policies where working together to make sure that there's interoperability, to make sure that uh, the, uh, you know, that, that the companies have access to as broad a set of markets as possible, while respecting, uh, you know, the the security dimensions of uh, of that we all have to be mindful of in this day and age, are also uh, are also very important. And then another one that um, you know it, it, uh, that that's that I think uh, Dr. Mosca mentioned, which which I think governments can actually play a bit of a role in, is um, is connecting or, or or enhancing the awareness of of uh, of uh, potential users of these technologies and connecting uh, those who need to, who, those who stand to benefit as users of these technologies with the industries that are actually supplying those solutions or trying to supply those solutions. Because we have, uh, governments have a range of programs that, that uh, you know, work across the spectrum and often they're not very well connected <laughs> to one another. Uh, and to the extent that we can kind of bring the collective power of, of national governments and by extension, you know, government to government collaboration to connect the, uh, you know, the research community, the, 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 the developers of these innovations, and those who will be the ultimate users of these innovations, we can actually just accelerate the cycle of, of, of knowledge uh, that can, can really help to foster uh, the industry. Excellent. Thanks very much. And we, we are um, coming to time, but I want to get some of our audience questions in. We have a great question from Hassan Jabour at uh, the University of Ottawa. He asks, um, uh, where does materials manufacturing like quantum dots and other quantum materials stand in this, in this initiative for bilateral cooperation? And he notes, uh, citing my fellow Detroiter, uh, Madonna, saying, after all, it is a materials world. So Without coming on Madonna, does anyone want to jump in on the uh, on the question? Well, I'm a materials guy, so uh, <laughs> I'd love to answer it. This is definitely you know something I am passionate about, <clears throat> and, the, and and it comes down to the the state of the science, right? You know, we don't have the transistor discovered yet, so there really is quite a broad, still quite a broad field of technology out there for computing, but as well as for sensing. And that means there's a lot of material science still to do. And material science, for anybody who's um, working it, takes a long time. You know, it, it, it's something that uh, you can't necessarily rush. So it really behooves you to explore the space broadly with friends. <laughs> you know, and not everybody can do every techno every every type of semiconductor, every type of superconductor, etc. So you know, it, it's a great area where you can look at the science strengths of individual countries and say, look, you're really great at that. We're really great at this. Let's work together to, to, to watch it, watch each technology and see how it goes um, uh, so that we can, we can monitor their success and then choose later. Because, um, you know, the, the other key point here is that quantum technologies aren't, it, it is an expensive game to develop 
um, each type of qubit technology. And uh, you, the, the more advanced they get, the more expensive that, that development gets. And so sharing makes a big difference. And, and Celia has done some work on this as well. I think she wants to talk. Well, I was going to pile on and say I'm a materials girl and um, uh, feel the same way. I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental area of science that is going to be critical to scaling up any of the technologies, uh, frankly. And um, we had a workshop um, shortly before COVID shut things down um, that showed the lack of understanding, frankly, in the sort of atomic level materials characterization um, that lead to the or, or in, impact the performance of the devices. And so um, because the, the field of research came out of the physics world and, and there are many great um, materials physicists, um, that multidisciplinary aspect to uh, the materials understanding and fabrication, being able to make very accurate, precisely what you want, um, and the theory on the physics side is a real opportunity for collaboration. And uh, there was mention of the nanoscience and nanotechnology capabilities in um, Canada. There is a network of such capabilities in the US and these are often operated in open ways as user facilities. And some of those, I sit on the advisory board of a nano center, such one of these centers. And I've been sort of telling them they really need to understand what the quantum industry needs are so that they can support those. So I think that's probably true in both countries and um, that's an opportunity as well. If I could just quickly jump sure. in as well. Um, so it's obviously an important part of the supply chain. Uh, and we've been talking about one really important direction, probably the, the most impactful direction, but there's also in the other direction, quantum algorithms, uh, one of their believed applications or well-studied applications is improving the design of, of next generation materials, uh, which kind of dovetails a bit with Charles Tahan's point of a question about where will quantum computing have impact, where the first order we could say, we don't know, it's a marathon, it's, it's worth the beginning, but um, it's very hard to predict and we need to, we need to study that. And the only way to really to know is to, is to work with the experts, with the industry, with the leading academics to study that. But that, that's really value added work uh, that we need to engage our quantum computing companies uh, to help with across all you know, the critical sectors of our economy. Well, that was a that was a good question. They got a lot of uh, a lot of you involved. I'm going to ask one final question before we wrap up, and that's from Carolyn Seven, uh, who writes, "You know, what about the European Union? Um, it, it, I know from being a Canada U.S. guy, sometimes we just talk about our own little North American, uh, you know, friends here. But in terms of bilateral cooperation across a range of, of friendly countries, where do you see the potential with Europe, with Japan, with Korea, with with others um, that we could bring into this mix?" Any, anyone want to talk a little bit about that or, or throw some countries out where there's some real promise? Well, maybe maybe I could start off. I'm sure others could Please. could could join on that point. Uh, you know, um, we've we've been having a lot of sort of bilateral engagements, as has the U.S. with respect to other countries, uh, in France and, and Germany and 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 others. Um, We've also uh, uh, we're also working towards the possibility of associate membership within uh, within the Horizon Europe framework, uh, which would uh, you know open up a, a whole range of opportunities for collaboration for Canada uh, on some of their flagship programs uh, focused around quantum technologies as well. So I think there's it's you know I, I think um, as I said earlier I think that the um, the ease of collaboration in, in Canada U.S. just makes it sometimes a little bit it's some, somewhat in the background because it's an assumed kind of relationship. Some of these other relationships, they need to be fostered in, well, some of these relationships just, just are naturally fostered in a more deliberate way. So we've had more of these types of uh, agreements and, and, and formal kind of structures in place with other countries uh, rather than the Canada US one, uh, but they certainly are an important piece of the puzzle because this is a global, uh, this is a global enterprise. I can say here that, um... Please. This is a great example where the the industry consortiums of the respective countries and the industry itself can play an important role because if you look at what the companies want to do, where they get their parts from, uh, the lasers, the fridges, the electronics, um, materials, 
that's the network <laughs> of countries that you really care about. And if you look at that, you know, it's Europe broadly, you know, US, Canada, Australia, UK, Japan. I mean, it's not, it's not hard to list the, the company, the interconnectedness of the supply chains and the people and um, the, the know-how, you know, becomes evident pretty quickly. And, and so that, that's who we should be working with, you know, and continue to grow that global marketplace. Yeah, excellent. Oh, Mikola. So, a few times in my opening remarks, I mentioned end allies or entrusted allies, and Europe's at the top of that list, right? We want to be exporting to Europe and help Europe benefit, and we're also going to need and want to import some great European technology as part of our overall uh, solutions in, in this space. Excellent. Well said. And unfortunately, uh, we've come to time. So it falls to me to very quickly thank our really amazing panel, Dr. Charles Tahan, Nippon Vats, uh, Mikhele Mosca, and Celia Mersberger Bakker. All wonderful. A special thanks to uh, my Wilson colleague, Melissa Griffiths, and my Wilson Global Fellow extraordinaire, Eric Miller, who, who was inspiration for this. If you have not seen his quick backgrounder that he developed for us, it's linked to on the webpage for this event. Please read it. You'll find it very handy. Sh handy. Share it with your friends. And with that, I want to thank our great AV team here, all of the, those of you who have tuned in to watch this live. And remember, if you didn't watch it live, you can watch it recorded on the Wilson website. So take that link, send it to your nerdy friends. Uh, they'll really appreciate it. This was one of the clearest discussions of a very important and yet a little bit challenging topic for those of us who struggle with science class. So I, I wanna thank all of you for sharing your expertise. I wanna thank everyone for being part of this. And from here to uh, eternity. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much.